Buonasera, good evening everyone, benvenuti all'Istituto Italiano di Cultura. For those of you who are here for the first time, my name is Emanuele Amendola, I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute, and uh, uh, welcome for the opening of our new exhibit, Flora, by Atelier Manferdini. I'm so glad... <laughs> yes. You actually deserve an applause for making it tonight, because uh, I understand it was quite challenging. I mean, the, the, the story behind it, this event was a little bit uh, challenging. As you know, uh, we had to postpone because of a power outage uh, last time. Today, we had to face a storm, uh, Mr. President coming to town and blocking you uh, on the motorway, but we are here, so uh, thank you for being uh, with us. Uh, before we start uh, the program, allow me uh, a little disclaimer. So, uh, you read the invitation and probably you picked up uh, one of those uh, uh, postcards uh, at the entrance, uh, which, uh, is, uh, which is generated through uh, artificial intelligence. So, you must know by now that uh, tonight uh, we will focus a little bit on uh, AI. Some of the pieces on display uh, are created uh, uh, with AI, and this is going to be, uh, you know, one of the subjects uh, of uh, our talk. So, what I did is I asked my new friend, Chat GPT, to uh, write my welcome remarks for tonight. And uh, this is what uh, it wrote for me. Thank you all for joining us in uh, such large numbers today as we unveil the captivating exhibit Flora by Atelier Manferdini. The genesis of, it, of this exhibit uh, traces back almost two years ago. You can't hide anything from AI. <laughs> I vividly recall my early days in Los Angeles when the talented artist behind this show, Elena Manferdini, graciously invited me to experience her expansive personal exhibition at the Pacific Design Center. I was immediately captivated and somewhat taken aback. How was it possible that such remarkable works adorned the wall of the PCD yet had not graced the halls of our institute when the artist was Italian? I, I guess AI has a point, right? <laughs> but let's uh, set just aside for a moment. Elena's work is truly mesmerizing, delving into subjects that resonate deeply with our contemporary world. Her exploration of nature and its intricate interplay with the artificial, her visionary approach to design as a conduit for human emotion and aesthetic identity, and perhaps most, intrig most intriguingly, her incorporation of artificial intelligence. So this part of the remarks, I have to say that I put a lot of input uh, into the program, into the software, in order to get the, desi the desired result, uh, maybe I wouldn't use the, uh, such words, but what's coming next is actually very interesting because uh, from a very few keywords, uh, it developed this. Indeed, in the age of AI, questions abound. Will artificial intelligence render artists obsolete or will it serve to empower them in unprecedented ways? How will our emotional connection with art evolve in response to AI's influence? And uh, these are not just uh, inquiries into the future of art, but profound reflections of the very essence of creativity, humanity, and our relationship with the world we inhabit. As we immerse ourselves in the beauty and complexity of Flora by Tele Manferdini, let us embrace these questions with curiosity and open minds. Ah, this is not bad. <laughs> ah, I would say this, <laughs> wouldn't you? So maybe in the future, we will have AI also doing uh, panel discussions for us. But uh, for this evening, we are very happy and honored uh, to have uh, real humans uh, discussing uh, these uh, uh, same topics in what promises to be uh, a very interesting conversation. We have with us uh, uh, the artist herself, Elena Manferdini, who is the principal and owner of uh, uh, Atelier Manferdini. and also chair of the graduate programs at SciArc. We have with us uh, Claire Isabel Webb. She, 
she is the director of uh, Future Humans, uh, a program that investigates the history and futures of life, mind, and outer space at the Berggren Institute, uh, a think tank here in Los Angeles, which also has uh, um, um, locations in Italy, in Venice, and uh, uh, Beijing in China. So there is a connection with Italy that we are very uh, happy to highlight. And the conversation will be uh, facilitated by Frances Anderson, who is a journalist who covers uh, design and architecture in the LA area, and that many of you will probably uh, recognize for uh, having been the voice of uh, DNA at uh, KCRW for uh, many years. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming on stage our speakers. Thank you again for being here tonight. Grazie. Thank you very much, Emanuele, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I think I speak for the three of us in saying, um, well done for being here tonight. We, the three of us for a while sat on the 405, texting each other, you know, to try and find out sort of why we were just stuck in a parking lot. And Elena seemed to have this special knowledge about what was happening, which made me wonder, does she have superhuman or extra, <laughs> extra intelligence that, that hopefully we'll, we'll tease out of her tonight? But anyway, um, yes, so my name is Frances Anderton. When Emmanuelle um, called me and asked if I would be the moderator tonight, I think it's true to say, Emmanuelle, that I said, why me? Because to be honest, I, I, I'm probably on that, um, I don't know whether I'm skeptic or terrified or maybe a little bit excited and intrigued, but I'm definitely, I've, I consider myself to, to not be an expert on AI. So can I just, before we dive into this evening, can I just find, get a show of hands in the room here? How many of you are sort of already engaged with AI in a very active way and speak the language of AI and just want to hear from two people who are really out there in the vanguard? Let's have a show of hands who are sort of the AI. Okay. So what about a show of hands from the people who are sort of more occupying the turf that, that I'm in, which is sort of, what, what is this all about? Um, I think we may have more on the, on the, on the less, on the, the less expert end of things. So, so we'll try and sort of tailor our conversation, you know, to, to, to straddle both, both areas of, of expertise. But, um, but anyway, to the extent I do have expertise that I bring to the table, it is that I have known Eleanor for 20 years. And I even got married in a dress that she designed. And I bring that up, <laughs> and I bring that up to say that Eleanor stunned many of us in Los Angeles that follow design and architecture when we first saw a fashion show for which she had created some of the dresses that were modeled that went down a catwalk at the Schindler uh, Kings Road house. Um, and these dresses just blew people's minds because really very early on, as digital um, tools were being were starting to be more and more tested in the design realms, she was out there in front, and she managed to create these simply beautiful, dare I say it, if one can use this language today, feminine, beautiful feminine dresses with, with which she had used laser, cu laser cutting technologies, and she had somehow created these outfits that were both extraordinarily sensual, um, while at the same time really futuristic. And ever since then, I've just watched what she's done with complete admiration. Um, she's really, she, as you heard, she heads a department at SIARC. She's absolutely admired for her, for her teaching but, and her work, which straddles architecture, engineering. She's an architect and an engineer. Um, products, textiles, clothes, jewelry, um, you name it, um, Elena puts her hand to it and, and to increasing levels, I guess, with the support of technology or the digital hand or machine. What, you're going to tell us 
what terminology we should use. So anyway, here we are tonight, and after this talk, you're going to see her show, Flora, and this is where you see where she's going into this next frontier, which is embracing AI, artificial intelligence, for anyone in the room that didn't know that. Um, and for, for Eleanor, L AI, I think, is her friend, you know, not her, not her foe. In fact, in her words, AI is her silent but constant protagonist with whom she's embarked on a journey through a fantastical world and created the show that we'll, that we'll see afterwards and that she'll talk about. Um, and as, as she has put it, in our current age of digital ephemera and computational imagery, nature appears familiar and at the same time eerily synthetic. And the show exhibits this dichotomy. Um, and it's a great springboard for the conversation that we're going to have. And I'm so interested to get to know Claire as well and hear what Claire has to say about all of this. But I do want to say, just as, as the the skeptic, fearful, confused about AI person who also for many years at DNA tried to get a broad picture on things. I, I have definitely been following the lawsuits. I have been following the conversation about copyright and appropriation and um, what, 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 is the, what are the implications of feeding all these images or words or into the giant maw and Emanuele can have them spat out at the end sounding very cogent, but whose press release did it steal from? You know, I am interested in all of that. And there's a lot going on, not, not to give you too long of a list, but the New York Times is suing OpenAI over copyright infringement Taylor Swift is considering legal action over deep fakes made of her using AI tools. A federal judge recently took the side of artists in a lawsuit against generative artificial intelligence art. Um, and this was over this the argument that's bubbling, percolating up, the issue of uncompensated, uncredited, unauthorized use of images. Um, even in a room full of people from Italy, the Vatican has its own AI specialist, a friar. Did you read the story about the friar with his friar, what's it called, Tons tonsure? And he's got his little, little monk cell where he sits and thinks about AI and turns up at symposia all over the world discussing the ethics of AI. So anyway, there's a lot of really important questions that have to be addressed and they are being addressed and I asked Eleanor and Claire about it as we walked into the room and they said we're in this interim phase where this stuff is going to be sorted out right now we're in a kind of wild wild west and that's what we're going to talk about now and primarily what we're going to talk about is the art Emanuele did ask the questions what kind of art does AI produce? We're talking tonight mostly about visual art, I think. We're not so much talking about music or literature, um, but the same, some of the same questions pertain. We're going to talk about art. Um, Emanuele has introduced um, Eleanor and, and, and Claire. Um, Claire, who's really out there in terms of... <laughs> <laughs> really, in, a, in fact, in outer space. Um, so so with, with that, we're going to sort of start um, hearing from them. Um, and they are both going to give a short presentation, Eleanor, about the ideas behind her floor exhibit, Claire, about her work um, with, 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 the, with the new human or the extra human uh, realm that we're going into. Um, they're both going to give a presentation, then we're going to turn to some more questions, then we're going to open the floor to all of you for questions. So, Elena, tell us about Flora. Um, thank you, Francis, and thank you all for being here. Um, Flora is an exhibition about um, nature in general, and just to frame it, not all the pieces you see there are produced with AI, actually. The majority are not, but some of them that I created actually for this show were thoughts through AI. And so this is mainly what I'm gonna uh, present tonight. 2022 um, has been the year of text-to-image AI tools. Midjourney, Disco Diffusion, DALI have been spreading like wildfire uh, with foreseeable impacts on the current creative economy. Among these images generators, Midjourney, the one that has been sued, I guess, <laughs> differentiates from others because uh, its visual results are, I would say, pretty by default. And they're capable to produce an overall fine art aura 
in a variety of styles, um, trained on a wide set of images of different styles and historic precedents. This tool associates the reliably aesthetic images, often delightful and whimsical, like the ones you see here, um, to simple text prompts. And the tool truly is designed to um, unlock the creativity of ordinary people by giving them the tools to make beautiful pictures just using their words, by describing them. And this is how um, David Holt, who is the owner of Midjourney, the Midjourney founder, describes the tool he created. And this was exactly the first experiment I made with Midjourney when I opened it in the beta version. And maybe Midjourney was not yet trained that much at that point, and maybe I would say it did create something more special because of that. But just to say this text to image, I think is a game changer in many ways because design as we know it will no longer belong to a relatively small group of well-trained individuals, usually uh, artists, designers, or others, musicians, etc. Visualizing one's imagination will be a fully democratized practice taking place in online communities, which is Discord, where we are co-imagining and this new human aesthetics, open sourced visions will eventually spill out into our real world. And this is one of the statues you will see in the show work, which is really and truly the first um, experiment to bring something bidimensional into three dimension and existing in physicality, which is still a hard job to do. So there is, yes, there is the AI, but also there's a lot of labor, <laughs> good old labor to get something actually from image to reality. And I think it's not a so distant future. And not a what future? Not so distant, a future. Mm -hmm. Let's see if the video can go here. Where visualizing one's imagination will be open source, real time, three dimensional, which is not yet three dimensional, and interactive. Essentially, AI is holding a mirror to our society. This is how um, Prisma Lab explains the existence of biases in stable diffusion, the, which is also what happens when you use these tools. They never give you exactly what you imagine. They give you what a collective imagination produces. And it takes a quite a bit of trial to get to what you somehow you wanted, or maybe it's un undomesticated as an imagination. And so this is a small example of the second exercise I gave myself with AI. It's called Pick Me. It's, I've done it in 2023. And it was trying to grapple with ideas of identity in a time of emerging AI. And these images could be loosely associated with self-portraits. And you see on one hand the first image, on the other hand the last image. And I did this exercise every morning for a few months. Um, giving exactly the same text prompt to AI and see what happens through the different versions, from the beta version to the first and second, etc. And also seeing what happens when a collective imagination imagines something you give them as a prompt. So something like a self-portrait, let's say, when it's not produced using a cell phone camera, but they're generated by Midjourney, departing from a single text image, it becomes a progression that shifts in nature while you select. And this is a series of temporal progression of faces. Scrolling through the faces, viewers notice that the age of the women oscillates from childhood to womanhood, and the initial image uh, of manga cuteness transform into the enchantment, to the point that this is the last, one of the last images. Um, and this AI-generated series uh, reveals how cuteness as a name, as, a, as a, the word itself, had, is an aesthetic commodity of the powerless in our culture. And so it contains, yes, ideas of aesthetic um, connection, but also violence in it. And, um, and I think Siang, Siang Gai, she uh, works on this kind of idea of cuteness, which was one, the word in To the Trump, 
that really made the whole session of series of images going from one end to another. So really the piece is a display of the way AI tools also proliferate dominant culture within powerfully beautiful images. And while I think it's impossible to fully eliminate human bias from human-made tools, it's important also to question if AI-generated images might end up reinforcing dominant culture and reveal maybe something about what collectively we associate with words that you might not even have in your mind when you start working with these tools. Um, also on the idea of identity, um, there is a series of mirrors um, in the show that you will be able to see soon. Um, they try to question the idea of um, where we are at in terms of identity today. Um, I'm sure that all of you have a cell phone right now and you have been texting or connecting with other people. Yes, we are in real life here, but there is also an image of ourselves that is connected to um, other people out there. Um, identity, I would say, is partially at least online. And maybe the biggest triumph of the digital age is this transfer of our identity into the digital space. And this is not merely a mental transition. It's not just not being you know, worried about what happens beyond being here now, but our bodies are online too with our pictures, the voices, uh, our locations, our geographical positioning. And so it really, uh, I think there is an idea of identity that presents itself through an interconnected set of data um, there are shared data online, and so we have witnessed truly really a paradigm shift in the way in which we communicate and how technology somehow gives us the opportunity of creating a digital alternative. And our sense of self is split between who we are in real life and who we represent ourselves to be online. Avatars, face filters, deep fakes, are just the beginning of the manifestation of a larger global transition of our sense of self into the cloud. And so part of the exhibition is actually in augmented reality where you um, can take one of those um, invitations, there's a QR code in the back, and you can engage um, with, through your phone, in another reality, which is an augmented reality where this uh, faces and exists uh, between you and your cell phone. Um, and so there is also this coexistence of, yes, a physical space at the ISC, but also a digital one in your own phone when you go through the exhibition. So if you see the QR codes, you can engage with them. <laughs> and this is just the last example of maybe the hidden uh, the other space, which is the one you bring with you at home through your invitation and the QR codes uh, in the space. And with this, I will um, give my microphone to you and maybe we exchange spaces. <laughs> so, okay, you have your own. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Great. Over to you, Claire. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Elena, wonderful. So, um, I talked to Elena like maybe two weeks ago, um, and we were talking about um, the collision of worlds the artificial, the natural, the synthetic. Um, and I was really interested to learn that Elena begins her practice, her artistic practice, in the virtual. And I think it's a wonderful starting point to think about what's virtual and what's real, and how the slippage between them is creating new ideas about nature and new ideas about the self. Okay, one more. Okay. Okay, it looks like my, okay. So I want to talk about, um, I'm a historian of science, so we're going to go back a few couple centuries and talk about the concept of the virtual, and I hope that you keep it in mind um, when you see Elena's um, uh, beautiful exhibit in just a few minutes. 
Okay, does anyone know what this is? Yes. Yay, okay, great. So um, this is uh, uh, Galileo's sketchings of, of the moon. Um, and as you can see, the sketchings are rendered in what's called chiaroscuro, a study of shadow and light on the moons. Um, and he was able to do this first because of a new technology of perception, a telescope that he improved upon. And how a telescope works is it creates a virtual image, and I'm talking about like an optical technical term, a virtual image within the telescope that is then magnified. And this new technology um, allowed Galileo to see the moon as something, as a new entity. So before, if the moon was imagined as uh, Dante called it, a, um, a perfect pearl, Galileo's sketchings rendered it with these, uh, these crags um, and these like weird geologies. And so principles of disegno, as it was called in um, Renaissance Florence, the sketching, the chiaroscuro, the Euclidean geometry, the study of light and dark, his training as an artist um, allowed him to use this technology of virtual perception to then see the moon, this object, in a, in a new way. And this had a fundamental social aspect to it in the sense that he related the celestial, the moon, to the terrestrial, the earth. Um, and in doing, really called into question um, God's holy world uh, above the earth and what we think of as, as like the terrestrial um, as the earthly. So this virtual technology allowed a, a, um, a deeper penetration into, into, what we call, into what we call nature. Oh, and I love this. He called it the strange spottedness. <laughs> I always think about it when I look at this image. Okay, example number two for your consideration is the camera obscura. So I bet there are many Italian speakers here. Um, what does camera obscura mean? Dark room, dark chamber, exactly. Um, so it was a technology that, that scientists like uh, Newton and Kepler used to sort out fundamental theories of optics. Was the eye like a mirror? What is a mirror? What kind of image does a mirror, does a mirror produce? Um, and Newton has all of these like wonderful kind of sketchings in his in his notebooks of like he's like poking himself in the eye with a with a needle. Um, <laughs> uh, it's it's he was really committed. Um, okay, so how a camera obscura works is it is a dark chamber and it can be as large as you like. Um, and the light waves. Let's if you look at the top right image, the top. Of, of the castle, because light travels in um, a, straight, a straight line, it then projects um, to the bottom of, 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 the, of the screen through an aperture, through the hole. So you can see that the image, the image of the landscape that our painter is, is producing, um, is actually like an upside down image. And this image, in contrast to a virtual image, is called a real image. Um, and it, it's because of where the aperture is. So I'm just going to quote from um, Constantine Huygens. Huygens. Um, he was a, a polymath, a mathematician in the, in the 17th century. It is impossible to express the beauty of the camera obscura in words. The art of painting is dead, for this is life itself, or something higher if we could find a word for it. Um, and I mention this because it just like really tells you that this new technology um, of perception was really important for like he thought this we we maybe he thought this was like our version of AI and so there are these um, emergent technologies that that reframe our world and we're in the middle of um, of that experience and I, I think that's really really exciting um, okay. So considering the camera obscura and Galileo's telescope together, um, these two technologies together were ways that uh, scientists, um, natural, natural philosophers as, as they were called, um, and also artists, were able to 
um, codify categories of what was real and what was virtual, and they did so through technologies of the hand and the eye. And so these virtual and these real images that uh, rendered nature in a particular way that amplified or extended um, raw human sensoria were um, a deeper way to understand natural objects. And again, I hope this is like something that will um, prick your consciousness as you, as you go through Elena's exhibit. Okay, so what I'm showing you now, now we're zooming forward a few centuries. So we think of the virtual, like virtual worlds and virtual realities and Apple's like virtual headset um, as these simulations of reality that exist in this digital landscape. Um, and I want to point out that <laughs> the, the concept of the virtual has existed for many, many centuries. Um, and also, it's changed very recently. So here you see, um, this is called the neural network on the left. This is the game of Snake. Who, who actually played Snake in like the 90s or 80s? Okay, so I've never done it. Um, but you can, so, so how this works, I'm just gonna stand up for a second, is that the, the cognitive neural net, as it's called, all four of those layers of circles, of vertical circles, are nodes. And it's learning how to, um, in this virtual world, better play snake to get the virtual food, um, not run into the virtual walls and its own virtual tail. So I, I think it's really fascinating that um, there's, a, there's a kind of transition between virtual technologies re-rendering so-called like natural, physical, real objects, um, and then we begin, in a, we begin in a virtual world, and the metaphors that we use to describe it are human, um, are human, human senses. This is a cognitive neural net. Okay, one more example. So this is this galloping Lego <laughs> is uh, created by my friend and colleague Sam Kriegman. He's at Northwestern University, um, and these creatures are just so fascinating. Okay, so he like cut off the limb, like poor virtual creature. Um, these are virtual worlds that simulate billions of years of evolution, millions and millions and millions of times. Um, so this doesn't exist, this creature doesn't exist in any kind of real physical sense. Um, it loses its legs and then it finds a way to like keep galloping. Okay. Okay, or does it? Indeed it does. Okay, so then Sam made a physical robot from a virtual environment. So considering the morphology that the AI technology produced in a virtual world, Sam was able to take one of the, the, the kind of um, billions of iterations of this shape to then create a soft robot in, in the physical world. So again, you see this, this circulation between the artificial, the synthetic, the virtual, the natural, the real, and all of these things are in, um, they're in, a, they're in a storm right now too. Okay, I'm just gonna go to the last slide. Okay, so I wanna end by going back to the moon. Um, no longer Dante's perfect pearl, uh, so who knows this image? Yes, but which image is it? Um, do you wanna call it out? What, what's the image on the left, or what is this image? Earth rise from the moon. Yeah. The Apollo 8 astronauts, yeah. So um, what, actually I will go back. Maybe it will start. Okay, so this is created using Midjourney, and what I did um, is I asked for a hyper-realistic Earthrise photograph by the Apollo 8 crew, and this is what Midjourney came up with. And you know, I was actually surprised by um, the. It's. It, it didn't, it wasn't, act, even though the photograph like is, is and I don't use this word lightly, iconic, um, why didn't it just make the, like a kind of a digital like smeared or whatever rendering of, um, of, the, of the earth rise image? Why, why is like one moon, or sorry, one earth like lower like on the moon's horizon? It's very weird. 
The first one is the real image. The second one is the mid-journey image that I chose. And the third one, um, perhaps in the, in the spirit of kind of um, blending, blending um, multiple realities, is um, the real image and the mid-journey image combined. Um, so I'll leave you with this, is that how we define categories, how we shift them through experiments with technology, with techniques of the hand, through artistic interventions, um, changes nature and changes ourselves. Thanks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Very, very interesting, M much to think about. But both of you have mentioned or deployed mid-journey. Um, is there anyone in the room that didn't fully get what mid-journey is, just to sort of start, start us off? I think we should explain, because, because what we're talking about here are that right now there are these um, different um, AI systems, I guess, that, 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 that download internet, that download images or words or music or pieces of film from the internet, they just, they just, it's a giant moor, they just scoop up all these images and then the different systems come out with different, um, almost, almost languages and you both have been drawn to mid-journey, a specific system for a particular reason. Eleanor, you did start to talk about, I think, the ability to achieve a sense of, of, of prettiness. Um, mid-journey seems to be set up by its founder, owner, to 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 is the word spit out to to, to assemble to, well you you explain it you explain it better than i but i think people need to understand what this is because it is different from another system called deviant art it's different from one called stability ai it's different from wally wally is it wally it was um dally 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 was one of the first to be introduced and shocked everybody when we saw that Dali was a, was a visual image produced and you could give it a text command and, and you could say something like, give me a picture of two girls on horseback, you know, galloping towards the sea and out would come this image. And when this first happened, it, it was very shocking to people. And we've now had about a year, I think, in which we've been sort of processing the impact of Dali. But you're not interested in Dali, you're interested in mid-journey. I think it's because Midjourney is probably the most, the easiest to use and has uh, reliable aesthetic results. I think that's the reason for the success. Reliable? Did you say reliable? Yes. I think there is a reliable aesthetic <laughs> results, which um, is something to say about AI and the uncontrolled. Um, you know, you're working with it, but what you have in mind, it might not be what you get back in terms of results of design. I think there is a reliable aesthetic, pretty by default, in the software. And therefore, I think that's why most people are attracted to it. Also, I think it's the Discord platform that it works with, which is very well known and easy to use. So I think it's about access and democratic uh, um, output. It doesn't it always get you something that um, has stylistic qualities, I think. But it's so interesting that you, that, that one want, that you want pretty by default, that you're actually, tell, you, you too used Midjourney. Why did you use Midjourney? You know, I had fun like everybody else <laughs> at, at, at the beginning. Um, but I kind of stopped using it because I, I no longer felt surprise or delight. Um, because of these reliable images that it would yeah, generate. Yeah, so, 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 so Midjourney is a tool that, um, that, uh, that, you know, um, trawls uh, the internet and relates text to images and then creates like an amalgamation with a ton, a ton of data points. But just like an artist in the beginning, Midjourney had certain presets, you could call them, that rendered, um, that rendered the outputs, the images that you that you asked it to create, in a really particular style, um, they almost looked like like the Harry Potter covers. <laughs> like they all looked like that. And I think that um, as artists and creators have gotten much more specific in their prompting, and as Midjourney has um, added more and more kind of like presets, like you can add a, a chaos, you can add a, um, you can add chaos to the image, um, and that that differentiates them. So, you know, 
we're, we're just in the beginning and artists are really like f figuring out what it is and, and, and how to use it. And as a result, um, the, the technology is learning from the artists too. Which of course opens a whole other door into um, all the artists that it's learning from. There are many, many artists whose work is being trolled in order to then um, feed these uh, text requests. But let's just talk about the text piece because this is another piece of AI that has been quite hard for, for many of us to get around. This notion that you're now in a visual realm, visual art, and yet you are using words as your tool. Um, we've We've, we've, we've generally understood, irrespective of, of Galileo, irrespective even of David Hockney's explorations of, of perception and perspective in early Renaissance painting, irrespective of technology on, and, and, its, and its many advances and the way it has shaped perception. Nonetheless, generally, one understands a visual artist to, to primarily have a relationship between hand and eye. Here's my pencil, I draw. I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily even a verbal person. Many artists have not been especially verbal because they are, their, their hand, hand to eye is their language. And yet here we are now talking about visual artists really being kind of directors, sort of speaking into the machine. So can you talk a bit more about that? Because that seems kind of really fascinating. It's about mode I of production. At, at some point it became interesting that words <laughs> are the most um, important things to create, which was not the case for a long time. No? The, the most important scripting tool is actually words. Now, you can tell, uh, you can ask to do something and maybe that's a scripting that you get out of it, it's even for coding. So it's, it's interesting that now it becomes really democratic. You can describe it, I can describe it. It doesn't take an expertise to actually ask something or give direction and the expertise come from the, in, you know, comes from the system. So I think that, that to me is the most uh, interesting component is the level of collaboration of humanity somehow in these tools because you're not working alone and that it doesn't require a high level of expertise from the user point of view. But might you start getting better art or better AI generated art with better words? As in people th who have I more descriptive powers? I think the system became more sophisticated because many people work on it, meaning and they train the system, choosing and selecting. And also I think the tool itself became more sophisticated because now actually it can work also through images. So it's not, you can have a blend between images and you don't even have actually to start with a text anymore, a, a prompt text. So you can- you don't have to start Not anymore. anymore necessarily, if you don't want to. You can actually have multiple images, blend them together and you start like precedence. It would be, oh, I take this and I take that and I blend them together and you decide what uh, the blending is and what the more dominant uh, image is. So you can even ask the AI to describe the image so that you can have a text that describes the image that you can then input back into AI. It's, it's, it's a lot of things have happened and, <laughs> and it's only the beginning, honestly. And, and I think we're talking about something quite small in terms of AI, which is this visual small app. It is just um, became so, important, like wildfire in every single desktop, in schools and artists, because of its, its easiness, I have to say. I think that, that how accessible this technology became. But this is a question for both of you. It could, could this be, and here's the skeptical me talking, could this be the, the ease that we all felt when we were introduced to our first McDonald's hamburger? And we thought, this is great. It's fast food. It's so easy. Processed food, this is the future, it's wonderful. And then we got our fix, and after that, we went back to want slow cooking. You know, we go back to slow cooking. So for it, so might we be in a kind of binge mode at the moment where it's really fun and exciting, but but our hand is going to atrophy, and are we going to get to a point? Are we going to get to a point where actually we sort of realize that that making art is the process? as much as the end, and if, the, and if you're a sculpture, sculptor and your process is um, working with clay or whatever, and, it, and it's the feeling in your hand of the, of the tactile experience, and that's gone with text to image, do you think we might ultimately yearn for it, or do you think there might be a subset of artists that won't ever abandon that? 
I think there is a group of people that really are accelerating this technology, and a group really of are what? accelerating, they're pro, and some people that are against. Um, and as any technology comes out, there are people that are nostalgic about what you lose or um, are extremely happy about having something new. I probably always tend to be on the side of who tries and be positivistic about how you can use it, at least I try. Although with a critical eye, but I do think that um, there is something to be learned and I think it's something inevitable about these tools. Um, I just also I think really Mijani is one of the very small um, applications that is much more that is much more relevant in terms of AI. But let's say that um, I'm not sure the slow food and the fast food is the right um, analogy. Analogy, I'm not sure the food is the right analogy, but um, I'm not sure. I think the, the whole issue that people have right now is how to monetize something that happened to be successful. How to, how to monetize. What? Amortize it. Monetize it. Uh, right, right. How to, how to, are you talking about monetizing AI? Yes. Or, I, right. think, I think everybody is going towards a tool that is successful, has, mon has a lot of applications, and how do you monetize a huge investment that has been made towards um, these applications and who gets to get the fruits of that applications. And so I think everybody that is looking into um, lawsuits clearly are mm. trying to get royalties through of their work, which I think is completely a fair process uh, of saying, well, then if you use this and that, then shouldn't I be part? In the same way as Spotify at some point, um, when music went from the being physical to digital and there was a moment where nobody um, monetized it, it was shared online for free, and then became an issue for both artists and uh, you know the record houses and then there was a tool that uh, in a way that might not please everybody but somehow distributed um, the rights uh, to the people that invested in yes the technology on one end or the artists that invested in their in the work so I think at some point uh, there will be a system of laws and regulation that will um, Probably, probably create a base for the use of this technology. And I think right now it just doesn't exist. And so there is a lot of um, discussion about what it will look like and what it should look like. And I'm not necessarily the person able to give any recommendation about it, to be honest with you. So it's not my um, expertise, but I think the main issue here is not slow food or fast food, is more um, who are the players of this technology, who has invested in it, who's winning the race, and how people participate, people pay to be using these tools, um, and we think that, you know, and this money, where, where it goes to sustain more development or other things that went into the creation of the, of the tool itself. Oh, I'm glad you want to talk about the monetary side of things, because I think this is obviously the, the big elephant in the room, and that is exactly what's being sorted out, just in terms of the art, the artistic experience, the production or the per perception, that's where I was bringing up the, the analogy between slow and fast food or between, um, I don't know, sewing clothing by hand, knitting, crocheting, rather than having a machine make the crochet or whatever. But, um, but to that point about um, the rights, we, I think any of us that are following this, the, this, the legal fights that are happening so far, currently it's incredibly difficult to pass out sometimes the sources. Sometimes it's very direct and obvious. You know, I've certainly heard of uh, artists, uh, video makers who have seen their own work suddenly being trolled uh, and reappearing in the guise of another artist, under another artist's name, it's been slightly tinkered with by AI and it's like, whose art is it? Is it the same, Claire, to the extent you even follow, follow the sort of legal side of things? Is that um, similar at all to previous steps in our, in our um, evolution, I guess, with technology? To say, um, to say the struggles over whose photograph was it in uh, Andy Warhol's um, paintings, you know, that, 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 or Richard Prince is being sued over a couple of photos that he, he, he borrowed pretty 
much <laughs> with hardly with just putting his own different caption on virtually. So is that, are we? Is that a kind of rather similar sort of set of circumstances? Do you think that we're dealing with? Um, I, I think. So I think that there's no such thing as a difference, the difference between humans and technology. These two things are sensuously entwined and one cannot be thought without the other. And so I would back up from your question to say that, that there is this external technology that then sets up um, like a battle uh, between humans and machines, this like binary opposition between them. Um, I, just, I don't think that that's the right question, uh, even just ontologically. Um, and I also think that there's always anxiety about the use of um, the use of technologies and their impact on what it really means to be human. And I want to point out that humans and machines, like these aren't two monolithic categories. <laughs> like AIs, like there are myriad, myriad AIs, um, and there are many ways to be human. And we use tools, we invent tools, we make tools um, that, that have a whole like plethora of, of, of uses. And also, in a, in a time of great change, in a, in a time of technological transformation, in a time of human transformation, um, there's this anxiety. And so I think it's good to just self-reflect and just notice that, that anxiety. Because, I, because, yes, I do think that we're in a moment of a paradigm shift of, of how we've thought about art and what we're going to think about art. But there's going to be another technology like Midjourney um, you know, 50 years, 100 years in the, in, in the, in the future. Um, and we were talking about this before. I think maybe a more interesting question is not one of authorship, but one of, so I'm all for the democratization of, of art and we should pay, you know, people um, for what they've created. Um, but I think a more interesting question is not authorship, but authenticity. So who what gets to be an authentic piece of art? And so, you know, Elena, you mentioned um, the aura. <laughs> um, and there really is something to standing in the Sistine Chapel and soaking in, soaking in the aura. You can also get that through um, a virtual reality. There's a phenomenon called, uh, it's like homuncular flexibility. And in virtual environments, you like don a tail and your body starts like, like you have weight here, like a dinosaur, you can imagine like a, a dinosaur. And you counterweight your body like this and you start to like behave as if you have a tail but you're in this virtual world. And so that again sets up this circulation between um, the embodiment of what it means to be a human in a virtual world created by humans but that the machines learn from and then edit. And so I think that this like distinction between um, between like, or th this anxiety rather, of, of the legality and like the money, much more interesting questions to me are about the, the slippage and the, the permeation and the bleeding of worlds into um, the virtual and, and, and the real. They're very interesting questions. I think if your own work was suddenly showing up, you know, in somebody else's um, credited piece, you know, you might feel slightly different about where the priorities lay. But just in terms about, it's just in terms of what you've 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 just described, and and really the sort of slippage, I think is, is your word, you know, between um, human and machine. So, so. Just take, for example, the images that, that Elena has shown us that are in her show, which, which are most definitely cute and they're most definitely very alluring because basically Elena never produces anything that isn't lovely. She has a, a, just a gift. But even with those images, which, which are really compelling, I'm, I'm looking at the... The, the faces that are morphing, and I'm thinking they look like Megan. Did anyone see Megan? Yeah. About the little, yes, the little hellish little robot girl. I love Megan. If you want to <laughs> understand or get a, get a whiff of what's happening in this world, you know, and, but in, a, in a sort of fun kind of way, watch Megan. But anyway, the thing is, what, what, was, what, was, what was so weird and eerie about Megan was that her eyes were cold, you know. She had machine eyes. 
And I look at these little faces and they've all got to me like machine eyes. And you look at a Rembrandt or something, you look at the Mona Lisa and it's the eyes, the eyes have it. You know, can, can AI, can the AI trolls get the feeling in the eyes? I think the idea that humans, uh, that is creativity is uh, specifically human is what we're talking about in this question. And I think you come from the point of view of saying yes, there is something that machine cannot um, produce because they're not human. Um, and you think of this as being the livelihood, let's say, of, of the art piece. I actually think that creativity, it's, it's not necessarily created by humans alone. It is actually working with the computer or with the AI, you realize that it's a conversation. And it turns out that uh, what we thought uh, humans were great at, which is creation, we might be better at discrimination than creation. So generatively, the generative power of AI is shocking. It produces faster, better, more, I don't know. And, and then, but we're very good at deciding which one we want. And that is what I think maybe AI is not as good as we are at deciding immediately what we like and we don't like, uh, the taste of it. Um, it's, it's something in interesting because AI also works in that way. You generate things and then you discriminate, meaning you have to decide which one to keep. Is it this or is it that? It, it, the whole process cannot just be generating things. It also has to understand what it created, whether or not it belongs, with a yes or no. And it's also better in the way in which AI, some model of AI create. And I think we're still quite good <laughs> at deciding what belongs. Um, much more than the creative generative component is what actually feels like we like or not. So I think that part maybe it's more, um, it, you know, to the eyes of the beholder in a way, to the eyes of the, in the eyes of the beholder. Um, I don't, I don't know um, if, if creativity is a human trait. I think creativity as we know it is part of a way of working um, with tools and has been the case for a long time. It has nothing to do with AI in general. I think it has a lot to do with how we augment ourselves in order to make things happen that we envision. Um, but the fast, the speed at which certain tools work today uh, took out a little bit of the romantic idea that we are the creators um, or that there is some kind of force of creativity that is uh, above us or goes through us or this idea of the divine. And you know, th there is a long history of saying there is a genius in us and everybody is a genius and everybody, the genius became the creativity. So we cannot say anymore that you're a genius because it's, a, but, we, but everybody's creative and that's something specifically human. I don't know, I'm, I'm very pragmatic about this. I worked with these tools and I feel like the, the relationship with the tools is the creative one and the tool themselves has a generative power and iterative power, there is nothing divine about it, to be honest with you. Um, but we are the one still deciding what we decide is a conversation, because at the end of the day, artwork is a conversation. What does it mean uh, is only if it starts channeling certain responses and, and we're still the one that decides whether or not there is a reaction to that. It sounds like you're making an endorsement of editors. I've always thought yes. editors were the great <laughs> uncelebrated makers. So we <laughs> let's finish on that. Let's finish our our conversation on that thought. And now we're going to throw it open, throw the floor open to questions. Um, Emanuele, do we have a microphone? For, so do do we have any? There we go. Question over here. Uh, I don't know if it's really a question. Maybe are two observations, but maybe they can then be, uh, there can be a sort of an answer. Uh, I was struck by the quote about the, uh, the guy who talked about the camera oscura that said that the, that was the end of the art of painting because, you know, with this technology was possible to create images. And I think obviously this was wrong because uh, the art of painting didn't die after the, the invention of the camera obscura. And even obviously a painter like Canaletto who used the camera obscura for his paintings, you cannot reduce these paintings just to the use of the technology because then there is an added value which is you know, the value of his brush strokes, the way in which he 
can you know, render effects of light. So there is a, obviously something more than just the use of a technology. And in some way related to this, the other thing that I heard is about the end of expertise or something like that. And uh, I think there is one case where at least at the moment AI is failing and is actually about recognizing authenticity in, for example, old master paintings. Because uh, there are, I've seen cases even recently in my profession where a copy or copies after like a painting by Raphael was sort of authenticated by the AI because it seems that everything, you know, is the same. There is a perfect analogy in forms, but it doesn't take into account something that evidently AI is not able to recognize at the moment, which are the quality of the brush strokes, the, you know, many other aspects that makes a painting by Raphael, you know, by Raphael and the copies, copies. So I don't know if you want to say something about this. Yes. Uh, well, I, you know, I want to, what, what Alana said about taste is something I really, I really liked. Um, I think that we recognize, like, I recognize beauty and I'm drawn to beauty and I want to live in beauty and I appreciate beauty. Um, and I have a certain style. I have, like, I wear my hair a certain way. Um, and, like, taste and style. Um, you know, I wonder what it would be like to ask an AI to create a style that like hadn't existed before. But it seems to me that something like the paintings that you're mentioning, like many art historians, like <laughs> many of, of his contemporaries agreed that like this was beauty, that this was technique. Um, and I, so I, I feel like it's one of, one of those things like you can't really define, but you know it when you see it. Um, but again, I don't want to discount that like an AI would be able to create and recognize a style that that we would consider beauty and we wanted and we wanted to keep pursuing. Is that a satisfactory answer? <laughs> Another question? One. Oh, I think oh. The mic's at the back of the room, it'll come to you next. Uh, question for Elena. Uh, the use of flowers and butterflies, did the, do those represent something specific that, or, or something you're trying to say? No, everybody asks me and I, you know, I don't know why I do it. But, um, it's a subject matter that I think, um, you know, and you're all Italian, so I'm just going to say natura morta. No, it's, it's not about natura morta itself. It's not about the apples and bananas. It's about um, the composition, the tools, uh, the techniques. And I think there is a lot about the work that is not about the subject matter, but it's about the way in which um, you use certain tools. So I don't think they have a symbolic quality. I don't choose them more because they're of colors or, or things, it's about what you do with them. So the Natura Morta becomes um, a still life exercise. Um, and I think that is why I choose them. So it's somehow a genre of, of work that many other people have been working on before. And so it's not about how I position them or you position them, it's how you talk about them or you work on them and me too. So it's not about the subject matter itself. Mm -hmm. And so a lot, that's why I use self-portrait, well, portraits in general, or there are genre of, of work that I think has been out there for centuries, actually. And they are opportunities to learn, develop, and become skilled with tools that may be used the first time. And also is one of those master and student exercises where you differentiate yourself from others, not because of the subject matter, but because of the way in which you operate on it. And it, I think it's a pedagogical tool that I use very often when I teach. And if there are students here that I've had in the past, alumni, all of them probably went through one small exercise at the beginning of their career where at SIRC where um, this becomes a way for them to enter, um, enter the school. And I think it's a bit of a 
project that I give to myself as well when I want to enter a new tool, set of tools, is so that I don't have to worry about what the subject matter is. It's about how you operate on it. Does it answer? So, <laughs> I, actually, you've generated another question because I think you're using both the words still life and natura morte, Same. which they're the same thing except they're slightly different words because natura morte is dead nature, isn't it? Whereas still life is still life. And oh. it's interesting because your images are the still life of flowers or they're the dead nature of flowers and then the dead nature of faces. And so there's... Yes, and I think some of them come alive through animations or through AR, so there is clearly a second layer of um, liveliness, I think, to the work. Maybe the, you know, are the eyes vitreous or uh, alive? I think it, there is a desire for, I would say, anybody who does anything outside of themselves to, um, you know, give life to the things they make. <laughs> It's a very humane thing to do, is to, and I think that's part of the project here. Yes, yeah. of course. And it's the, and it's also the part that I think probably raises most reactions in people's, in people's minds and eyes as they take in the images. There was a question just I'm here, sir. I'm yeah. Okay. Oh, you're okay. Um, no, question over there. Um, I'm not sure if I can articulate this, but I think there are two hypothetical scenarios that came to mind. Um, so um, with a lot of these models, there actually was a, a, a area of research into what called adversarial attacks onto these networks. What is the word? Adversarial attacks adversarial. onto the networks. So like mm -hmm. um, there's, there's an academic interest in uh, certain techniques where if you inject a faulty or um, a maliciously designed set of images into the training set that will throw off these AIs' perception of reality such that when you give prompts to these AIs, you just basically get numbers or static. And I guess the hypoth hypothetical scenario is what would that actually mean by, I don't know, like maybe the art that you, the art that you, you produce from such networks, are they trustworthy or, or I guess, in that case, what actually is perception? Um, or what, is it like a schizophrenic model or something like that? You know? Uh, the other the other thought was this is not an original thought of mine, but it'd be interesting to see in terms of hypothetical scenarios is that um, there was a ML conference in Long Beach around 2017 where one commentator mentioned that um, perhaps we're we've already been living in a in a society ruled by AI because if you look at a neural network, it's a bunch of nodes and weights and they communicate with each other and so on and so forth. But if you look at uh, entities like the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, where you have about, I don't know, 400, 400 some nodes with their own weights and, and connections, and the Senate has, uh, was it like 100 nodes and, and their own weights? And the output from some of these bodies already would arguably be a bigger um, determination of reality than some of these networks. So have we actually been living in an AI world for several hundred years now? <laughs> are, you, are you saying that the House and the Senate are robots? Well, neural networks, right? <laughs> ne well, networks and maybe neural. I don't know. I mean, it's arguable if they're a network or a neural, but <laughs> one could say they're... The, the point was, like, when they invented representative government, which comes up with his own different decisions and, and decisions have we in the real world is that have we already been living in the AI world and, and this is all not that new I definitely defer to our historian of past and future here <laughs> um, I think you can describe most things as um, through systems so yeah hu humans are nodes of information um, like on the snake video the, um, the the four layers of the cognitive neural net each node is is one of, of information um, and decision making. So, you know, I get really prickly when people say, oh my God, like the AIs are ruling us. Like there's no, there's no like AI overlord. <laughs> there are many, many, many AI tools that humans deplo deploy in many, many, many ways. And sure, you can think of that as um, a dis like distributed network of um, interacting uh, entities that have different ontologies. I think you say that about anything though. What's an ontology? What it is. Thank you. And that's a great way to end. 
Um, it is now time to actually go and see the show itself, which will be a pleasure. And then... <laughs>